define a forward rate agreement, and describe its uses. In this section, we are going to go through a very brief introduction to forward rate agreements. These contracts are generally dealt with in some detail in the Level 2 and Level 3 exams, so here we are really just looking at a general introduction. Remember that with a futures or a forward contract, there is some underlying asset which drives the performance of that contract. For example, oil prices drive the performance of oil futures. Foreign exchange rates drive the performance of a currency forward contract. With an FRA, the underlying is not an asset. It's an interest rate. FRAs are very useful to many different entities for many different reasons for the simple fact that almost everything is affected by interest rates in some way. Using FRAs, we now have a way of trading in the risks associated with interest rates so a business can protect itself without trading in the underlying reasons for those risks. One common use for FRAs is to lock in lending and borrowing scenarios. A lender might use an FRA to lock in a minimum return from an upcoming loan to guarantee that each period they will receive some minimum interest amount. A borrower might use an FRA to lock in a maximum cost of a future funding, ensuring that their periodic funding cost will not exceed some fixed value. FRAs are often based on LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, which is the rate used by London banks when they lend each other US dollars. Okay, so we have all the background, so to finish this, we just need to quickly look at the terminology. If I am going long, a 30-day FRA on 90-day LIBOR, what does that mean? Let's break it down. In this case, we are the long party, also referred to as the borrower, meaning that we pay the fixed rate amount. The short party would be referred to as the lender, and they pay the floating rate amount. A 30-day FRA means that the term of the hypothetical loan upon which the cash flows of this FRA are based is intended to start in 30 days. A 90-day LIBOR means that we are basing the floating rate side of this FRA on 90-day LIBOR. Explain how swap contracts are similar to, but different from, a series of forward contracts. Remember the structure of a fixed for floating swap from earlier in the derivatives material. One party has agreed to pay a fixed rate amount, A, each period, in return for some floating rate amount, denoted here as B. This is very similar to the structure of a set of forward contracts, each set up to exchange a fixed amount for a floating amount, where each forward expiry corresponds to a swap date. If we consider just one of these forward contracts, it's important that you see the parallel between this A term and the cash payment of a forward, as well as the B term with the asset delivery, which we saw in the previous section when we were discussing forwards. The A term is the fixed price, and the B term represents the ever-changing value of the underlying asset. It may be worth a little, or it may be worth a lot, by the time the contract expires. Recall that when calculating the price of a forward contract, we effectively calculated the future value of the spot price and accounted for the net cost of carry. Because the fixed rate side of a swap is equivalent to this forward price, we can use the same method to calculate this A term. What's important to realize here is that the net cost of carry amount will be dependent on the length of the forward contract. Holding a physical asset for a shorter period would incur a lower cost so a shorter term forward will have a different price to a longer one. This is the difference between a swap and a series of forwards. The fixed pay side of a swap contract doesn't change through the life of the swap, but the fixed rate side of a series of forwards will because of the effect of time to expiry on the net cost of carry. Distinguish between the value and price of swaps. Again in this section I must stress the importance of the wording of the LOS. All we need here is to cover the difference between value and price when it comes to a swap contract. We're not talking about pricing and valuation equations 
we're not looking at actually calculating prices or values given some market data. All we need to do here is understand what we mean by value, what we mean by price, and what's the difference. One key thing to remember here is that with the derivatives we discussed earlier in this section, pricing and valuation are guided by the principles of replication and arbitrage. Now when it comes to the term price, we're talking about the fixed rate side of the swap. What rate is the fixed rate payer paying in order to be part of this contract? Now don't let this idea run away with you. When you hear price, just think the rate the fixed rate payer is paying. When it comes to the term value, we replicate the cash flows of a swap using instruments available in the market. For example, if we wanted to replicate the cash flows of a fixed for floating swap, we would issue a fixed rate bond taking in principal and obligating ourselves to pay a fixed amount each period. And then we would replicate the received floating side of the swap by investing that principal in a floating rate instrument with matching cash flow dates. With a commodity swap, we are contracted to pay a fixed rate in order to receive a certain quantity of aviation fuel each period, for example. In this case, we again issue a fixed rate bond in order to replicate the fixed rate side of the contract, but in this case, we're going to invest the proceeds of that bond into some instrument whose value is linked to the price of the aviation fuel we expect to receive. Each period, this security must pay us some amount equal to the market cost of the aviation fuel, which we would then buy ourselves.